Hi, I'm Kevin Pulaski from Paradise Found Studio, and today we're going to be talking to Michael Genova, and he's an iconographer and does other types of work in acrylic and foil, heavily influenced by the Renaissance. And so we're going to be talking about his artwork his, and his influences. So hi, Michael. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Kevin. How are you? <laughs> doing great. Hey, uh, first thing I want to talk to you about is I read on your website that you had an epiphany in front of the, uh, the statue of, of Moses. I, I'm assuming that's uh, well, the Michelangelo statue. I'm assuming that's the one in Rome. Now, can you tell me something about that? Up till that point in my life, that was around in high school when I was in like 10th grade or so. I drew and I liked art, but it was mostly you know, like video game art, cartoons and stuff like that, more like kid stuff. But we had this project in 10th grade where we were studying the Renaissance. I picked Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, of course. I kind of got fixated on this statue of Michelangelo. I saw it in books and I saw, you know, the statue of Moses. And it just kind of captured my attention, my imagination, everything. I got just like obsessed with ever since then. It was just like something hit me. I, I don't know why. That's why I call it like an epiphany because it was as if, you know, God was calling me towards that for some reason, because I sure didn't. And ever since then, I was just all on board with Renaissance art, and I just started studying it. Starting with what, what I feel is, you know, for me is one of your more fascinating pieces is, is uh, you know, St. Mark the Lion. There's a lot to unpack here, a lot of symbolism, um, you know, a lot of history behind this. You look at the lion, he's got his arms are, are shaped a different way. He doesn't quite have a body and the wings are in front of him. Is that more from tradition or is this uh, some design choices that you had made? It's maybe a little bit of both. Like I've seen it, like the wings are almost coming off his forearms. And I just thought that's interesting. Cause I, you know, you always like to, you know, capture something a little more interesting. You don't always want to do with totally been done before so you know you find little elements about these things that you can you know accentuate to make it a little different or something but the, um like the quatrefoil kind of around them that kind of clover leaf sh shape with the point you know that's called the quatrefoil and i think that alludes to the four gospel writers you know there's four points for so the the uh, face of of the lion is is almost human-like, right, with the piercing eyes. Um, so I, was that a conscientious uh, choice uh, to make it more human-like? Yeah, like I, especially with the eyes and stuff, I wanted, you know, it's more relatable, kind of, and I think that's the idea. And, you know, that's another thing that you, you can see you've done in the past, and it could be just that these people weren't familiar with how lions really look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like the, the old paintings where it's just like the babies look like old men and the, yeah. the lions look weird. And <laughs> Yeah, and it's another one of those things that it's interesting, you know. It's like it gives you another thing to think about, you know. It's like, why is this like this, you know. So it adds a layer of interest, but there's also some meaning towards it. Like, I think it it causes you maybe to identify more like it's human eyes you're looking at. You've done a, a looks like a charcoal or pencil and a, an acrylic of uh, Padre Pio. Uh, what about Padre Pio, a very contemporary saint? What, what, what about him uh, appeals to you? He was, uh, you know, very mystical and had a lot of, you know, miracles attributed to him. Very appealing that you can see this person who kind of exhibited these wonders and miracles in a modern age. You know, you tend to think sometimes like, oh, these miracles and these wondrous things only happened a long time ago in stories and harder to believe. You don't see those things happening nowadays, but that's an example of, you know, God working in our time. And it kind of reaffirms that this stuff is real. Like there, there are miracles that occur. There are people with this kind of... Um, grace that they can perform these kind of acts you know to glorify god and it's not something that is just legendary like this stuff is real you know it happens and padre p is a good example of that all right so i'm, I'm, I'm looking at your 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 icon of uh, saint jude uh, thaddeus so what's he holding in that picture the little medallion that he's holding it's called the mandolin mandolion of edessa it actually comes from a legend that said there was a king in Edessa, which is in modern-day Turkey. 
they think he might have had um, leprosy or something like that, but nobody could find a cure for him. And he had heard about Jesus and his miracles and his healings. So he kind of sent emissaries to find Jesus and ask him, you know, like to heal him. They found Jesus and asked him if they could heal him. And I guess he couldn't actually go visit this king. But he imprinted his face in a piece of cloth. I think they said they sent, gave it to St. Jude to take to this king. It, it instantly healed the king of his leprosy or his disease or whatever it was. I guess later on after the crucifixion, this guy became Christian. Cloth with the imprint of Christ's face on it. And it was revered for hundreds of years. And I guess they say that they can trace it to even being around in the 12th century in Constantinople. Now looking at St. Veronica, your painting of St. Veronica, it kind of goes along with that. So I'm kind of bouncing around, but it, it, now the face uh, on your painting of St. Veronica, that reminds me of the, the face of the Shroud of Tur on the Shroud of Turin. Is, did you model it after that or is that uh, sort of a coincidence? Not specifically, but you know, obviously you see these things around. So it kind of maybe works into your unconscious and comes out. Uh, all the detail around that, uh, what's, uh, wh what were you trying to accomplish with that? It looks almost like marble or, or stone. And all the decoration is meant to kind of encompass and kind of glorify the actual image of Christ, you know, like, and I think that's a good use of decoration, you know, whether it's in churches or anywhere, it's like you got this whole edifice of decoration, but it's all focused on drawing you back, your attention back towards the important thing, which is, you know, Christ and what he, you know, what he came to do and everything. Like, like being in a church altogether, so you have this whole structure and all this intricate detail all around you, but it's all in the service of, you know, glorifying God. And so you, I'm looking at your painting, St. Patrick. I mean, first of all, what, what uh, jumps out at me is the, the bright colors. I mean, I guess that's the advantage of the acrylics, isn't it? You know, when you think of Ireland, you kind of think of those bright greens and just bright sky and, you know, even alluding to what Patrick did, he brought brightness and light to, you know, that kind of dark pagan, you know, society. Yeah, now, one thing that surprised me is in the corner, the bottom corner is one tiny little snake and that's, that's, it's one of the cooler parts of the legend of St. Patrick, but probably the, the most of that's unprovable, you know, a bit of a, you know, truly more legendary. Um, is, is that why you de-emphasize the snake part of it? Or uh, what was your thought process there? No, because like, like I said before, um, I like to think of these legends as being true, you know, like, why not? Like, that's how I always look at it. Like, okay, like scientifically, maybe, oh yeah, snakes were never in like Ireland or whatever, but I say, why not? You know, like the reason it's, down there in the corner is because you know the whole idea is that saint patrick expelled the snakes which is the metaphor for like the evil of the paganism and the society that existed in ireland at that time so it's like the snake is relegated to that bottom corner and about to be basically kicked out it's like evil is being squished to this corner in a way you know like saint patrick is the light of you know, that great saint is pushing evil down. Um, what's the, now what's the structure behind him? Um, that's similar to the, um, I have uh, ruins depicted in the St. Jude painting too in the background. And I feel like whenever I, I use that, I get, maybe I use that imagery a lot, but it, it's showing the kind of collapse or the, the fading away of that old way, the old paganism. Now I noticed, um, a lot of your paintings in this, I don't know if this is a personal style or if this is taken from uh, what you're trying to accomplish, but a lot of your figures are very long. The, uh, the fingers are very slender and long. In terms of the hands, like the hands are always very expressive and I, I kind of like strong hands. I think you can get a lot of expression out of how you, you depict the hand. So having longer fingers gives you more like leeway to maneuver them in position to be more expressive. So like elongated or taller figures. I think I recall that um, traditionally I think the proportions of a man are like seven and a half head tie. 
And I, I remember Michelangelo always did his figures eight head tie. And even that little difference kind of gives a little grandeur to the figure, like a little larger than life. They used to do that in illuminated manuscripts and early Renaissance art. They would have, you know, more important figures as taller or bigger, you know, just to signify importance and hierarchy within the image. The thought jumped to my head at Pieta, where you've got uh, Mary that's, you know, so large and Jesus is, is you know, I don't know, he's probably, uh, you know, two thirds of the size of Mary, uh, you know, and Leonardo was was busting on it, I, it, but you know, there's no way that was an accident, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you're not spending that many hours carving marble. And going, oh, geez, I, I messed up, you know. <laughs> so, Michael, thanks for taking us through all your artwork. I really appreciate it. Please, uh, we want to hear uh, more from you as, as you come up with this, some new materials. I want to remind everybody that uh, Michael is featured on Paradise Found Studio dot com. Uh, that uh, web address is down below if you're on the our, our YouTube channel. Uh, Michael's uh, web address is also down there so you can see uh, a wider array of his work. If you enjoy this video, please like us and please uh, subscribe to us. Uh, we're going to be uh, doing these every couple of weeks. So, uh, so it comes to your feed, uh, subscribe, and we'd like to keep up on this.